Hello, good afternoon. Is this working? Can you hear me? Great. Thank you for coming back after lunch. I appreciate it. So my name is Finbar Cornwall. I'm an industry head in travel in the UK. So it means I run one of the travel teams in Google. And I'm going to be talking to you about practical versus magic, the vision and reality of artificial intelligence. And in particular, I want to talk about smarter marketing in an AI first world. So first, the vision of AI and machine learning. Super important, I think, just to start with a definition. So if very simply, AI is the science of making things smart, then machine learning is a technique used to develop AI. Now at Google, we tend to use AI and ML, so short for machine learning, we tend to use that interchangeably because machine learning is at the heart of our techniques of developing AI. To be clear, machine learning is just a subset of AI, but it's totally dependent on the developments in computing power. And for us, it's kind of one and the same. It's how we're developing our AI. And so just to go one level deeper then on machine learning, it's a type of artificial intelligence that provides computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed and when exposed to new data. That's what machine learning is. Now at Google, our vision is to be an AI first company. This is Sundar Pachari, who's our CEO. And he has said that machine learning is a core transformative way by which we, think we are rethinking how we're doing everything. Now, AI and machine learning to be effective depends on huge amounts of computing power. And that is one thing that Google has a lot of. And we've been doing a lot working on AI and ML. And we're starting to share a lot more of that with the public. And you'll see, we'll go through how some of that is being built into our products later on. But before I do that, I want to go back to the 80s. Is there anybody that knows what this is? Yeah. This is an Atari game called Pong. Now, at the time, this was quite a sophisticated piece of programming. You had to move the paddle to hit the ball. It was in the 80s, quite a sophisticated sophisticated programming. So let's jump forward to the modern day. And we have another Atari game, this time one called Breakout. Now, as part of the family of alphabet companies, we have a company called DeepMind. Now, DeepMind is headquartered in London and is specialized in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And DeepMind set one of their algorithms to try and solve Breakout. What's interesting about what they did is they didn't program in the way that you could with uh, the previous game, you've got to move the paddle here or here to hit the ball. They just said to the machine learning algorithm, get the highest score possible, and then let it go. And so after the first few attempts, nothing happened. It then tried to move the paddle, and it hit the ball. And so after 100 attempts, it then sort of started to figure out what it is that it needed to do. After 200 AI training episodes, it's getting a bit better. It's kind of knowing what it needs to do. And after 600 episodes, it was the best player that's ever been seen in Breakout. It figures out you need to tunnel the ball up the back, hit it off the side of the paddle, and it's the best player it's ever seen. Now, you might think that's not that impressive. Probably all of us with 600 goes and time to kill, we might be able to become as good as Breakout as this. So we decided, or well, DeepMind took that machine lagging algorithm and put it against the most complicated game man has ever seen, or man knows. And that's Go. Now in Go, there are more positions than atoms in the universe. To put that into context, in chess, there are 10 to the power of 40 positions. And chess can be solved by computing power alone. And we've seen that before, when you can just calculate every move that's possible. In Go, there's 10 to the power of 170 positions. It's impossible to put enough computing power to calculate every one of those options. So we put a machine learning algorithm against that. What we did is we set the machine learning algorithm to become a master at Go, or DeepMind did this, and it then played the world champion at Go, a guy called Lee Sodo. And after the first attempt, you can see it took 102 moves to win. And in there, it made a move that no human had made before, and it took the master, who had 18 times world champion, 10 minutes to think about his response. On the second attempt, 37 moves. And by the third attempt, they totally smashed it. 
But you might be wondering, why am I talking to you about a game of Go? Well, I think the game of Go looks a lot like the world that you're all operating in. The number of permutations can sometimes feel like the number of atoms in the universe. You've got loads of moments, that customer journey getting more and more complicated. Many more, you know, five plus hours with digital, lots of different steps in the purchase cycle. You're trying to match that up with all the products you've got, the creatives you want to reach people, all the sites that people are at, and all these different moments that allow you to bid on. Feels a bit like the game of Go. And so whilst this can feel a bit scary, I think it also generates a huge opportunity for us. Because this is an opportunity for us as marketers to be able to reach people that matter to us in the moments that matter to them. And I think this is the magic of AI. The magic of AI and machine learning is to get us closer to one of advertising's most sought after goals, relevance at scale. Because advances in technology always give us new platforms, new ways of storytelling. Think about the advancements in TV totally changed the way that we want to talk to customers, and it changed what they expected from us. Machine learning and AI is going to have the same impact. It's changing the way in which we can impact with customers, and it's changing also what they expect from us as businesses. So you think about a customer journey. It starts somewhere, it ends somewhere. But it does all of this. And on Search and on YouTube, there's over a billion users every day who are looking for They've got intent, they're searching for something, they're, they're trying to give you a signal about what it is that they're after. And so the magic of AI is being able to take these signals and then personalize at scale. And this is only going to get harder, or it's only going to give you more opportunities. So Gartner Research tells us that there are 8 billion connected devices in the world today. So that's more connected devices than people. Yet by 2020, in a year and a half time, there's going to be 20 billion connected devices. All those connected devices are doing something useful for their consumers. They're expecting them to give them something. And remember, this is not just computers and phones. This is now smartwatches, your car, your refrigerator, your thermostat. All of these connected devices are pro providing something useful to consumers. And this is going to change the way in which we need to think about our businesses. Now at Google, we have a motto, focus on the user and all else will follow. And so we've been doing that. I want to talk about three things which we've observed, which I think are important to think about the impact that's going to have on our businesses. The first is that we've seen that consumers have become more curious. So we've seen a huge increases in the search, searches for best. But what we've also seen is that 15% of all searches that happen on Google every year have never been seen before. People know that they can go out there and instantly find any information that they want to know. How often have you heard the term, just Google it? People go out there and look for what they want to try and find. And it's many times things that have never been seen before. The second thing that consumers are doing is they're becoming more demanding. So we've seen a huge increase, again, in the searches for me. And for travel, we see that 60% of UK travelers tell us they would like to see less, not more. But really importantly, that less needs to be personalized to them. They want you to know about their habits and bring them something that's relevant to them. And finally, we see consumers are becoming more impatient. Huge increase in the searches for same-day shipping. People expect things to happen instantaneously. They've got used to it happening instantly. So much so that three quarters of travelers tell us that they abandon a booking if it takes longer than one minute. We heard on the earlier stage that Expedia are focused on getting their site speed under two seconds because they see that people bounce if you don't get it done that quickly. But remember, in the modern day, you're no longer competing against your traditional peer set. In a digital world, you're competing against the best experience a consumer has ever had. Think Amazon. That's the bar that people expect you to be delivering against. So all in all, we're seeing this newly empowered consumer. He's more curious. They're more demanding. They're more impatient. They're expecting more from businesses, expecting them to understand them, expect them to take all that data and to be able to give them something that's more relevant to them. So if this is some of the vision and the magic of what AI can give us, I want to talk about the reality of AI. And I was asked to talk about how practically 
you could go away and bring some of this to bear in your businesses. So here are my three practical steps to make artificial intelligence and ML your reality. The first is do it with Google Ads. The second is customize your own AL using machine learning with Google Cloud. And the third is to do it with partners. Now, as you saw the, uh, the quote from Sundar earlier, Google is now an AI-first company. It's at the core of everything we're doing, and it's now embedded in all of these products. AI and ML is embedded in all of these products at the production scale that only Google can deliver. But in Google Ads, we've embedded artificial intelligence and machine learning into many Google um, Ads products that you can use for free. Any marketer can use for free. And I think the reality of taking advantage of this is to ask you to automate. Because automation allows you to make smarter business decisions in real time. I was talking earlier with some people. I know that can feel a bit scary, the sense in which you're handing over the keys of the kingdom to a black box. But it's not about that. I think it's about asking the algorithms to do the finickety, fine stuff that humans can't do. There's no way we can make the same amount of decisions, process that much data in real time. And putting your trust in that frees up your time to focus on the, the bigger things that matter to you. What's my strategy? What are the business goals that I'm trying to drive? You know, trust in the automation. And for Google, this automation comes to bear in our real-time technology in three areas. Auto-targeting, auto-bidding, and auto-creative. Let's talk about the first of these, auto-targeting. And to help understand this, this is an example of my own. So recently, I was looking to go away to Brighton. I wanted to take my wife away for the weekend. And I searched for hotels in Brighton. And an ad showed up for a hotel in Hove. Those who know, Hove is kind of next door to Brighton, down on the south coast. But what's interesting about it is that hotel did not have Brighton as one of their keywords. But how did they find me? Well, auto-targeting can take the content that advertisers have on their website and match it up with user intent and find me interested in going to Brighton because it's next door. And they're kind of matched up to what I wanted. Can find me, match up their content with my intent. The second area is automated bidding. Now, I might not be a valuable customer for this hotel. And we all know that not all customers are created equal. Some will create more value for you and some less. So what automated bidding can do, can take all of the signals we were thinking about earlier, all of the data from these connected devices, can understand intent, understand context, lots of other signals, and through that can understand whether I would be a valuable customer for that hotel and then know the price that they should be bidding to show their ad for me. So auto-targeting has found me, and auto-bidding has decided whether I'm somebody that the hotel should be going after. And the third area is then auto-creative. Now this hotel actually has properties all across the UK. And trying to manage all of those creatives, they've got new facilities coming online, they might well have new deals coming up. Trying to manage all of that is expensive and time consuming. So instead with Auto Creative, you put in some of the key parameters and voila, you get an ad that's relevant to me. So Auto Targeting will find me, Auto Bidding will know the right amount to bid, and Auto Creative will build something that's relevant to me. So the hotel can do all of that and find me, hopefully, a valuable customer for them. And so I want to give you one example of how this was used by a travel company. So on Virgin Experience Days, use one of our automated targeting products. It's called Dynamic Search Ads, or DSA. And they combined that with another product that's uh, Search Audiences. And so they took everybody that had visited their site, and they asked Google to find people that look like those, so lookalikes for those. And they combined that with DSA. And the power of that is they were able to go out and find new consumers, all consumers that were relevant to them, the content they had on their website, and customers that were similar to people they knew that were already interested in them. And the results of that campaign is it drove an 89% uplift in ROI and a more than 200% in, 200 increase in clicks and conversions using the power of automation. And for travel companies that have a huge scale of inventory, these products are very, very powerful. So that's the first way I think you can take advantage of AI and ML with Google Ads. The second way is with Google Cloud. Now, I have a couple of my colleagues here, actually, just in the back row. They're waving. We can all look at them. 
Um, they'll be talking uh, tomorrow from Google Cloud, but I just want to give you a little taster around what Google Cloud can do. So there are two key ways that Google Cloud can add value to your business. The first way over here on your left, you can take Google's data, its models, its computing power, and you can run your own, you can build your own machine learning models. But that does require quite a lot of sophistication and skill to be able to do that. So to make it easy, a cloud team have built a whole bunch of ready to use machine learning models. And these you can just pick up, almost plug and play. To give you one example, I know one client I'm working with has used our Cloud Vision API. And they've run every one of the pitches from their hotels through the Cloud Vision API to help to identify and categorize and find the best images. Because if you've gone to the trouble of finding a consumer, getting them to your website, and the landing site that they land on has a picture of the toilet or the car park, that's not going to be the best experience. But the Vision API will find swimming pool or sea, and will have that as your landing image. So you can easily just take some of these and plug them into your business. Now, two other examples I'd like to give you. The first is KLM. So they use Google's um, chatbot, which is a, a, a machine learning model called Dialogflow. And this allows you to connect uh, booking data, uh, booking systems, customer data, and ML to be super relevant to a consumer. What's important about it is it's always learning. So it means you get the power of the whole organization can be there to serve a customer rather than just the power of one. The second example, it's not from travel, but I think it's very powerful, is Ocado. So Ocado is an online grocery business. They have over half a million customers who are placing orders for groceries that Ocado then pack and then deliver to your home. Now, because they're online only, they're obviously generating a huge amount of traffic, emails, um, chats, so forth, all that interactions. What they were finding is they were getting a bit swamped with those emails, and particularly time-critical ones. All of a sudden, you discovered you've been caught at work, you can't get home for that delivery slot. So they built a machine learning model to look at sentiment, and that sentiment can identify what's actually in that email and surface up what was more important for their sales reps to be, or their, their um, customer services reps to be responding to. And you can see some of the, um, the labels that come out here. So here's an email that just says, good morning, I want you to know how kind my driver was. Thank you for the service. It's a lovely email, but you don't need to respond to that in two minutes. So that's flagged as feedback, customer service, they'll get to that in time. However, this red email here, high priority, I'm going to be delayed for an hour. They've got to respond to that one in minutes. And so by using this sentiment um, machine learning algorithm, Ocado are able to provide a much better customer service experience. So that's the second way. The, thir the third and final way that I think you can take advantage of it is to accelerate your success with partners. So with Google, we have established a broad partner ecosystem of both service partners and technology partners. So service partners can help you build marketing data packs um, that you might need to go and activate. Technology partners can do all the other stuff. They can help you integrate with APIs, transform your data, analyze it, visualize it. And the Google Ads partner ecosystem can help you automate and optimize your marketing across search and meta search. At its heart is ML and data, but around it, automation and marketing services. In Google, we provide various types of consulting, um, uh, business consulting, as well as API consulting, tech support to these partners, so they're there to service you. And this is not an exhaustive list, but there's a huge range of partners that we're working with, many of whom you can find um, out here today, presenting today, who'll be working with Google that you can then work with to take advantage of the machine learning that Google has, has built. So in summary, I think the vision and the magic of AI is it can get us closer to advertising's most sought after goal, which is relevance at scale. But the practical steps you can take to get there, is you can either do that with Google Ads, you can customize your own AI using machine learning in the Google Cloud, or you can do it with partners. Thank you. I think that was, um, that was a very good introduction and insight. Um, Finbar has kindly allowed 10 minutes of his slot for questions. Are there any from you? Um, there, are, there are people walking around with microphones, I hope. Uh, but if not, let me start with one. Sure. Um, one of the things that I hear very often is, you know, I, I, I buy into the vision of AI 
and I know where to start, you know, one of those three options, but how do I get my staff comfortable with bringing AI into the workplace where they may have to work with AI or they may have to give up part of what they do or they may have to learn something else. What advice do you have for people about managing the human part of the AI equation? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. <coughs> I think. Uh, Mike, Lewis? Yeah. There we are, yeah, yeah. great. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a great question. I think there's a couple of things to think about. Um, the first part is, and I think Mike spoke about this on the keynote actually, is when you think about the industrial revolutions and the changes that happened, we don't see AI and ML in any way replacing activities that people do today or putting people out of jobs. What I have seen with all the, everyone that I has worked with who has adopted and bought into ML is it's actually given time to their staff to focus on some of the more value add activities they want to be doing. So for example, instead of spending in a marketing context, instead of spending all your time trying to scrape keywords, identify what it is that customers are interested in, building out all your accounts that are there, trying to understand what your bid should be, to trust into the algorithm to do that frees up your time to think much more about like the strategy questions, to think about how voice is changing, um, what's going on in real like, consumer sentiment and consumer demand. Um, thinking about new ways to get advantage, how you should be structuring your business to get the most out of these tools. That's where we can see people spending time. And the, first thing, the second thing, I think a really interesting um, debate that I'm involved in with some of the people I'm working with is what's the right way to bring this to life inside your companies? You know, and your two schools of thought is should you have a centralized pool of specialization that's kind of doing that internally within your company that's working on machine learning? Do you break that up and put that into different parts of your business? I think what we're kind of seeing on balance is that there is, there's benefits to both and depending on kind of your organization. But one of the things I think to keep in mind about machine learning is in order to do it properly, you've got to have lots of data engineers and they're super expensive. Um, and so the more you can take advantage of some of the pre-built options that you have here and get comfortable with it in an easy way. So just in a marketing context, taking advantage of some of the automated solutions that Google has, I think start to show people, okay, this is the sort of benefits I can get. If I can opt into automated bidding, that goes out there and decides the right bids. They can then see the time they can spend on other things and kind of get comfortable with that. Um, whilst I think the companies can think about the broader scale applications of ML, which are still probably better done in a smaller team. Yeah. Very cool. Um, Alexia is there with microphones. Any, anyone with questions? Otherwise, I'm happy to carry on. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the other implication of AI is it allows a business that embraces it to go into new markets, to maybe engage customers in different ways mm. and maybe even create different products. Um, what have you seen in the travel industry, the business model changes that have been generated as a result of people absorbing AI and yeah. some good stories about you know, yeah. how people have done that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, so again, thinking about some of the examples I spoke about, one of the key areas that we've seen is it can free up time for businesses to focus much more about the content of their product and what they're doing. So if you take a product like Dynamic Search Ads, that actually looks at your website, sees what content you have, and then creates ads. Actually, if you can spend your time as a business really focusing on getting the best experience for your consumers, getting hold of the best products, um, focusing on, okay, I want to get into a new market, and you start aggregating together, whether it's hotels there or um, experiences. To do all of that, you can focus on going out there to grow your business and probably the stuff that you're most interested in, and then rely on the power of kind of AI to actually take that and get that to market for you, get that in front of consumers. Um, so I've seen definitely some of the more sophisticated advertisers I'm working with, with the scale of products that they have, they're definitely heavily leaning on ML. Um, for that whole like external marketing phase so they can focus therefore on the core parts of their business which is the product, the customer service um, and try and differentiate that. Yeah. Okay. okay, very cool. I think, uh, yep, there's a question over here. Great. Thank you. 
So you mentioned earlier that you have data engineers and they're very expensive. I, I'm just curious from Google's standpoint, is there like a specialty team focusing on travel? And what are the strategies across like different continents of the world? Are there specific strategies towards specific regions or specific sectors of hospitality and travel? Thank you. Sure. So I guess two ways to answer that. Um, the first is from a sort of machine learning and automation perspective. There's not a particular set of data scientists that are focusing on that. We're building tools kind of at scale for advertisers to use. Um, we do, though, have people that are thinking about travel, um, thinking about uh, what it is that consumers want and users want. How do we ensure that we bring results that are relevant to the user? So you might have seen some of the products we have, Google Flights and others, um, which are kind of very focused on that, on how we can you know, live Google's mission of organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. We do have people thinking about that in a travel context um, because there are nuances in travel, um, as you all know. So we have a team of people focused on that. And there, they're definitely picking up on some of the differences in different markets, uh, uh, all the things which I think you'd know, uh, mobile-led in, in Asia, um, different types of payments options that you can see in different parts of the world. So we're investing quite a lot of money as well in the right sort of payment solutions. Yeah, as an example. Okay, we have uh, time for one more question here. Alexia in the front here, third row, fourth row. Thank you. Hi. You mentioned before uh, about uh, DeepMind. There is a sharp is. Uh, <laughs> Which one? The uh, DeepMind. Yeah. Uh, you have beaten, of course, Google. Uh, but on the other, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm not mistaken. You cannot beat the poker game, the poker uh, uh, players, uh, perhaps at this moment. AI. Uh, my question is that, uh, like in poker, we ha you have to do with uh, human feelings, emotions, behaviors, and things like that. How can you be sure that uh, the travelers? Uh, you can, uh, let's say, quantify the, the behavior of the travelers, you can predict the, the behavior of the traveler uh, and all these things when you design an artificial uh, intelligence model approach. Um, Do you have any particular uh, case studies that, okay, uh, we have implemented this kind of, uh, of project and we have seen, you told us some uh, impressive uh, uh, figures over there, but that can understand how the travelers feel, uh, uh, behave, uh, plan their uh, uh, travels ahead, and do well on. So if I understood the question, it was, do we have any algorithms that are better at understanding travelers' behavior, customer behavior? Is that right? Um, no, I think, as I said earlier, we don't have any algorithms that are focused. We're not focused on like the traveler, um, or there's nothing looking at particular traveler behavior. We tend to build our products at Google scale, so they're for every advertiser to use. Um, in doing so, though, we are taking into account all the same signals that we would for anyone else. So we understand when someone would be looking at travel videos, for example, on YouTube, or would be searching for, I want to go on holiday to X destination. So all of that we would capture. Um, yeah, and that would just get folded in, into, the, into the way in which that product would work for kind of any advertiser. But it obviously takes account of someone's interest in travel, so therefore we know that intent, intent with the, the, um, the supply. Ah. Right. Um, so if you have any specific, let's say, yeah. uh, uh, programs, any specific case studies that you have proved, yeah. I rephrase my question, the, person, the personalization of the uh, traveler, how, the, how you can uh, design such a model from AI. Yeah. So the question was, do we have a, um, can we find a way of predicting customer intent to be able to personalize to it? Uh, 
In one way, that is the Holy Grail. In another way, that feels a bit scary <laughs> for many people out there. Um, so we don't, no, we wouldn't have no way of like predicting intent of someone before they're interested. Or we can, we have observed signals when someone has shown intent that they're interested in, in a particular destination. Um, yeah, you know, machine learning is just based on feeding it data. So it needs data to kind of, kind of feed it on, of observed behavior. Okay, I think it's been a, a, a very stimulating session. Thank you for so My much, pleasure. Finba. Please join me in thanking Finba. Thank you for your time.